So, it's my great pleasure to welcome um, back to the department after a year of travelling the world doing classical type things, uh, Professor Paul Trower, who is going to talk today about enhancement initiatives and the dynamics of change management in higher education. So, thank you, thank you, Steve. It's, it's great uh, to do this. Uh, just a note, first of all, there is a huge prize sitting here. <laughs> Those who can spot a substitution, and that's all I'm going to say. First person to get it gets the prize. Okay, and it's pretty early on, I'll say that too, so you're not too distracted. <laughs> this came out of a research project, this talk came out of a research project that uh, Paul and Murray and I did uh, about a year ago, I suppose, a year and a half ago, something like that, and the publication uh, came out uh, of last, last year. And these are some of the publications, but the main one is the one on the left-hand side, which is our report to uh, the HEA and to, and to the Higher Education Funding Council for England. Um, the project basically was, sorry, the other things are stuff of mine that have relevance to what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Um, actually, I'll tell you about the project in a second. Let's stick to the structure here. Some acronyms for those who aren't very familiar with the uh, English <coughs> higher education system uh, are there. The, the, I won't go through them now. It'll take too long and we have to be pretty quick today and there's a lot to do. Uh, so uh, the slides will be available uh, on the website with the video and if there are things that confuse you, uh, they should all be there. So the structure of the talk then, I'm going to talk a bit about that project, and explain what it was and so on. Uh, then I'm going to say something quickly about the, what I call the tyranny of individualism um, and then go on to the second part of my title which is the dynamics of change management in higher education. I'm going to try and apply, have a bash at the beginning to apply social practice. Sorry? So into the talk, I forgot about the importance. <laughs> the prize is a do-it-yourself logo kit, so that you two can replicate <laughs> that, <laughs> that logo. <laughs> okay, well spotted. That <laughs> confused me for a moment. <coughs> uh, <dear>. uh, <laughs> Not a fix. Okay, well, when the report was uh, was published, uh, it wasn't, uh, it, of course, it got into the media, and this is the headline of the Times uh, paper, um, 50 a million pounds, half a billion pounds, has a superficial impact on improving university teaching. Well, of course, that wasn't quite what we said. What we were talking about was at the systemic uh, level. Uh, not that, that there was only a superficial impact generally. And of course they picked up the shiny projects, which is a nice newsworthy thing, which is the Christmas tree model of, of policy that sometimes, you sometimes find in the literature, discussed in the literature, where there are lots of baubles hanging on the tree, but they're not connected together, they're nice and shiny, and so on. And that's about polit politicians liking shiny, tape-cutting, big stuff. Uh, so, of course, Hefty were, were not best, best pleased with us and it was a slight conversation <laughs> afterwards, wasn't there? Uh, okay, so um, Hefty being the Higher Education Funding Council for England, and we're only talking about England here, not Southern Wales or, or Northern Ireland. Hi, Colin. You've missed the prize. You've, you've, uh, too you late. Prize. Yes, no, you didn't no, even no, know there was a prize. <laughs> 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 so... Uh, Hefke and its role then. So what we were asked to do was to review um, several years <coughs> from 2005 to 2012 of Hefke's enhancement initiatives in England and to see whether uh, they'd done the right things basically, whether they'd have an, had an effect and so on. Um, so that was our mission. I've got the research questions here but I won't bother uh, to read them. Um, of course, Hefke is only one of the bodies involved. There is a, uh, a mountain of quangos and other, other uh, bodies 
uh, engaged in enhancing learning and teaching in England. There's the university mission groups, there's the, learning found, uh, uh, the Leadership Foundation for Higher Education, UUK, QAA, HEA, GISC, Offer, a whole, you know, I won't go through them all. Um, on Friday, this is very apposite, probably now completely redundant talk, the Green Paper uh, came out and it looks as if there might be a big or small bonfire of Quango, Quango. so um, we, <laughs> we, shall, we shall see. Um, so uh, lots of things involved, there are lots, lots of complexity in the system and of course the system redolent with political ideology um, about the market, a, a neoliberal uh, ideology about competition and about excellence of course. Uh, the subtitle of Friday's Green Paper is, uh, what is it, Teaching Excellence? Fulfilling our potential, teaching excellence, social mobility, and student choice, I think, uh, to paraphrase it at least. So excellence is an issue uh, for this government. And, you know, who, who could be in favour, who could not be in favour of excellence, you might say, who could be in favour of mediocrity. But the problem with excellence is if you take an essentialist and unitary view of excellence, then it becomes a quite uh, a big uh, problem. And behind that, there's the discourse of derision. Interestingly, they didn't even bother in the Green Paper to be derisive in their research. Basically, one, one paragraph says, research in the UK is excellent, it's better than anybody else in the world, even for size for size in the USA. The very next paragraph says, we're going to fix it. You know? That old adage, if it's not us, then, then fix it. I think that applies there. Uh, okay, so we were looking at the strengths and weaknesses of what had happened from 2005 to 2012. We were thinking about the future, and particularly the future for Hefke as a, uh, as a body concerned with uh, enhancing learning and teaching for its future role and what would be the options without Hefke. And of course they, they knew that this free paper was in prospect and were thinking very carefully about uh, what the future might look like. We now know that there will be something to kind of, re well, will Hefke merge? Will it be replaced? It's not quite clear, but there'll be something one of the students on cohort three has come to call Ofsted. <laughs> I think it's rather nice. <laughs> the office for students, which include Hefke and some other bodies. HEA, QAA, we don't know yet. Um, so those would be uh, what we would do. Oops, what we were doing. And in particular, these are the things uh, that we were uh, looking at. Overall, there was a thing called the TQEF, the Teaching Quality Enhancement Fund, which Hefke set up. And it, I think quite an intelligent kind of approach, I think, to the enhancement issue in learning and teaching in England over several years, involving a, a multitude of different uh, initiatives at different levels and they were quite explicit that they were addressing the individual level for example the National Teaching Fellowship scheme which gave money to initially £50,000 to 50 teaching fellows at the uh, institutional level and at the, at the, at the national level with the uh, settle. so at the institutional level there was uh, allocated funding for enhancing learning and teaching uh, dependent on research uh, on, group, on teaching and learning strategies uh, the Centres for Excellence, 74 Centres for Excellence in existence from 2005 to 2010 at a cost of £350 million pounds in England only. You know, amazing uh, amount of money being, being thrown at all of this. Plus, of course, your market-driven neoliberal stuff like the National Student Survey, key information sets and so on. The notion that what's needed is more information to consumers so that they can make good choices. And we, we see that in Friday's green paper in a, in a very big way. Uh, what was omitted, um, some things they asked us not to look at because, uh, well, for various different reasons. Uh, strange, some of them. Um, you know, highly debatable. Uh, but the last one really aggravated me, I have to say, that we shouldn't look at other countries' experiences. Why not look abroad? Isn't that the very definition of being a learning organization, to look at other studies elsewhere? No, that was out of the 
remit. We did, actually, but essentially we were doing it on our own time, paying, paying for ourselves. I just, um, none, of, none of the three of us felt that we could not look uh, abroad. Division of Labour was Paul, I have to say, did the hard work of doing a literature review of all of the relevant literature, all, the, all of the evaluations of all of those things that I listed earlier on. So there was a, an awful lot of stuff uh, to get through. So thank you for that, Paul. Um, I did 15 uh, stakeholder interviews on, by telephone with you know, key people, key locations across uh, the system. And Murray brought uh, his long experience of evaluation and helped us to put the uh, report together. And I think in particular his knowledge of the Scottish system, you know, which we weren't allowed to <laughs> <laughs> compare to, it being another country, maybe that was the reason. <laughs> it's better. Um, <coughs> This is on video. <laughs> it's a bit better. I've got some water here. I'm fine. I'm fine. Uh, just apologies to the people who have to listen through the microphone. Um, so the bad news then. I, this is a sort of summary, and I'll, I'll, the next slide is a bit more detail on this. And. You know, it's tempting for me, and I have, to, I have to remember to say, there was lots of good stuff. The settles, many of the settles did excellent work, and they had a great effect, particularly in the institutions. Individual people benefited really well, and so on. What we're talking about is the system, because that was the aim of the whole TQF range of stuff. L raising all the ships. You know, that's, a, that's an interesting metaphor. Excellence. You normally think about excellence. You know, choose, let your, as Mrs. Thatcher said in America, let your strong poppies grow tall. And she, apparently she said under her breath, unless of course they're from the unions. <laughs> I don't know whether that's true, but I read that. Uh, so there's that view of excellence, and there's the raise all the ships view of excellence. Hefke's, Hefke's approach was definitely raise all the ships. Uh, and what we're saying is, Particularistically, um, there were huge benefits and huge outcomes and so on. But systemically, uh, no, no, there was a fairly stated aim, which is stated in the report of uh, the thing. So sector-wide enhancement missing, a sense of shooting in the dark. And I think that's, if you think about how the settles were selected, there were some great settles, as I say, but they were each selected on their own individual merits, of the merits of the application. There was no thinking about how did all these fit together. So you get repetition and, and gaps and so on. Did, did they actually address the needs in the, in the sector? And then what do we know? There was very little, there's a huge industry of scholarship and te of teaching, uh, but very little of it was used. And that, that's still the case, uh, I think. So there's a sort of gap, and that's not necessarily any, any particular group's fault, but there is a gap, I think, between the research and the practice. Things were not joined up. The usual thing about uh, policy, that these initiatives tended to be hermetically sealed from each other, so it's not systemic in that sense, too. There was, of course, because of the government, the neoliberal uh, view that we get uh, big time in the Green Paper, the view of students as consumers. Interestingly, the NUS you know, the manifesto for student partnership and rejecting the notion entirely of students as, as consumers. So even students or their, their representative bodies don't see it that way. And then this famous thing from the Times Higher, the, the shiny project. Sorry, I'm going at a quick pace here because there's a lot to do. We must finish on time. So there was a lack of wider engagement with uh, students and there was a lack of a theory of change. There was an analysis done of the, all of the applications to the Centres for Excellence, and, and one of the things they found was uh, that there was no theory of change. There was no theory of change. How, how does giving £50,000 to 50 people across the system in England change the system? <coughs> no. Good question. Nobody had the answer to that. <coughs> okay, so this is a summary of the the problems, and it's a bit repetitive of what I've uh, just said. So political agendas, resource allocation was turbulent, um, and, and things, you know, projectitis, which I think comes lower down, is associated with this. Yes, it's... it's um, so funding given, 
and then suddenly taken away. Um, so the this 350 million for the settles, or the half a billion for the whole thing, you know, suddenly appears, and suddenly people have to put an application together quickly. It's all done very quickly, and then towards the end, oh, we're going to stop it all. There won't be funding, and so people drift away, get new jobs, and the whole thing dies. There isn't a legacy, uh, etc. Noisy environment. I've talked about the multiple voices, multiple bodies, different priorities, etc. You could say it's a wicked system, w you know, wicked in the sense of highly problematic, no agreement over uh, the agenda, what's most important, no easy solutions to problems, no, no single solutions. The theory deficit, the theory of change deficit that I've already already mentioned. Nobody had really thought about change, and this is what I'm coming on to uh, towards the end. Parochialism, not joined up, uh, I've already mentioned, projectitis I have. Limited ability to establish sectoral needs uh, or identify outcomes of initiatives. Uh, outcomes is an important word, not outputs. Plenty of identification of outputs, numbers of workshops, numbers of publications, etc. But the outcomes, the changes, the actual difference, not well established. Um, and sectoral needs. Well, needs is a tricky one. You know, need, who, who, who identifies needs? Needs, to some extent, are in the eye of the beholder, but there are also real needs. So I think we can distinguish between, in a sense, ideologically defined needs and <coughs> actual needs. And not, you know. Um, the usual suspects, I think that phrase comes from um, the film um, Casablanca, doesn't it? You remember the, uh, the police officer? Uh, says in that wonderful accent that I couldn't possibly imitate, <laughs> round, up, round up the usual suspects. You know, the people who are the primary adopters, if you like, the people who are really involved and engaged with, interested in teaching and learning, etc. Uh, but moving beyond them, did it really touch them? Um, less so, much less so. And then the shiny baubles thing that I've already talked about. So, I mean, summing up the opposite of that, what does that mean? Well, uh, these things. <coughs> like the rest. They're, they're the logical corollaries of the previous slide. <laughs> oh, is that not? Cutting, cutting, opening, opening big buildings, opening, you know, photo opportunities. I interviewed somebody in the NUS, high up in the NUS, and that person said, you know, they spend a lot of money on this stuff. We do stuff cheaply. And she gave a great example of just giving a little bit of money to the representatives in the institutions across the place just to take out uh, academic staff members, heads of department, whatever, for a coffee and cake and pay for it just so that they could get up to speed, the reps could get up to speed, ready for departmental meetings and stuff. You think, yeah, you know, you give it every, a number of people in every institution a few quid, and, you know, you don't need these huge buildings. So, necessarily. So, thanks for stopping on that one. It's not immediate their office. <coughs> and, of course, there are systemic uh, problems that, you know, came up time and time again, in the, both in the interviews and in the evaluations. These things don't operate in uh, isolation. Of course, there's the ref going on at the same time, which is making people focus on other things than learning, teaching enhancement. There's all these bodies. The tendency for capture of particular sets of interests and agendas and so on. And the lack of a forum, as there is in Scotland, and I better stop making these comparisons, but Scotland has a forum for you know many bodies to come together and talk to each other chic. It's called. Uh, and to determine, or at least to advise on what should be the next enhancement initiative, uh, enhancement uh, theme, and so on. Uh, turbulent system, as I say, little interest in other systems in the world, internal incoherence, and methodological individualism. This, this, and I'm coming to this in a second, importantly, this tendency to focus on individual change, the change in the individual's attitudes, behaviors, and choices rather than to think more sociologically, more systemically. Um, then, okay, you know, as we were writing our report, we began to think, of what, what, uh, 
Okay, on this one. Yes. There we go. Um, what would an enhanced system look like? Okay, if they'd been successful, what would what would it look like? <laughs> Uh, and as I say, it's a wicked issue. It's an ideological question, or the answer to it, at least, with, with ideology. So those are some of the things that you could say an enhanced system would be characterised with. The easy answer, of course, is all of the above. But um, you, know, you can't have everything. Um, the answer we read, the actual answer we read on Friday, is of course more student choice, more information to students, more competitors in the playing field, more uh, alternative providers, and so on. So we need to probably think about all this. It's all, it's all very clear. <laughs> oh, and a better architecture. Uh, uh, so bonfire of quangos uh, and get Ofsted on the job, so to speak. <laughs> I think for me that's an issue and it's something that I want to uh, oops. 
to, yeah, okay. And, you know, there is a tendency, so this is about methodological individualism, I noted before. There is a tendency to focus on people. You know, we deal with people all the time. People occupy our thoughts and our emotions and so on. And we do tend to think in terms of, um, of, um, of, it, of individuals. And so the main focus of a lot of initiatives to enhance learning and teaching has been about changing what Chauve et al. And a lot of, certainly my thinking is coming from Elizabeth Chauve, who's here in the sociology, sociology department at Lancaster, uh, talk about, which is attitudes, behavior, and choices, and moving away from thinking about attitudes, behaviors, and choices of individuals and moving towards a, a social practice uh, approach. For example, the, um, reflective practitioner, the notion of the reflective practitioner, it is everywhere in education development. Uh, it grounds a lot of the textbooks and so on. What's it focused on? It's focused on the individual. Can you change, can you enhance learning and teaching in even an institution by turning a few people who do a course into reflective practitioners? I don't think so. I think it's the wrong answer to that problem. And of course, so that actually, that's the third, I started with the third bullet point, <laughs> the palpability of the person. And of course, we've got the neoliberal agenda that we saw on Friday, set out very boldly, um, focuses on the individual the student as individual chooser. Um, you know, Mrs. Thatcher said famously, didn't she, to, I think, the woman's own, in woman's own, uh, there is no such thing as society, only individuals and families. And then, uh, theoretically, so that's the political angle, the ideological angle. Theoretically, too, of course, there has been a trend to post-structuralism, post-modernism, and so on, some variants of which focus on agency and choice, etc., uh, construction of the identity. Um, so those, uh, that focus on the individual is instantiated in the uh, theories of change or exemplifications of change uh, approaches, um, like human capital theory example, the idea that if you fill, fill a person up with skills, they'll get a job and be happy for the rest of their lives. That totally ignores the fact that there may be no jobs um, in, a, it's a, it's in, a, in an envelope. The beacons of excellence, similarly, reflective practitioner I mentioned, and the contagion theory of change. You know, give, a, give a single person a load of money, they do a project, and somehow or other, the system uh, will change. I don't think so. Uh, so, I quoted this in my advert for the talk. Alan Ward, whose work I also like very much, uh, says that, and I think he is spot on. <coughs> this is about having a theory of change. Okay, I have said far too much. I'm now going to show you a video, which is a stitched together number of videos, and I'm not going to tell you what the, what, why, why it's here, I'd like you to tell me. So the question is going to be, what is the point of this video? <laughs> Sounds, got, yeah. Ooh, yeah.
Thus began the ceremony of enthronement, whose origins go back to the year 1205. Venerable Dean, 87 years of age, presented the Canterbury Gospels, the 5th century Italian manuscript believed to have been given to St. Augustine by Gregory the Great. Students at the University of Cape Town have been protesting to remove the statue of Cecil John Rhodes, one of the founding figures of colonialism. On social media, the movement has been called <coughs> Rhodes Must Fall, and it has sparked great debate amongst Rhodes University students. Issues of transformation have come to the forefront, particularly issues of changing the name of the institution. On Friday, 20th March 2015, students at the University of Cape Town held a protest outside the Bremner building, which is the heart of the institution's administration. This protest formed part of the Roads Must Fall campaign launched a few weeks earlier. Students are demanding that the statue of English colonialist Cecil John Rhodes must be removed from their campus. They also accuse the university of institutional racism and a lack of transformation in post-apartheid South Africa. A number of speakers addressed the crowd of protesters. Question then? Why on earth did I show you that? Any thoughts? Also from online participants? It, it seems to just suggest that change results from collective action rather than individualism. <laughs> <laughs> it proves my point entirely. <laughs> Jerry, <Jeremy, laughs> <moi. laughs> well, uh, uh, Yeah, thanks. <laughs> That is true, but it's not the only thing. <laughs> it, it does show that, and of course it's one-sidedly shown. Jan? Um, about how strong and enduring symbols of power can be, and yeah. pervasive. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that also. Don? Um, we're vested in tradition rather than change. That was the main point, yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, the power of history. Uh, mm -hmm. Natasha pointed me to some literature referring to social ghosts. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I followed that up, thank you, Natasha, because we see social ghosts uh, there, the power of, of the past, mm -hmm. um, the emergent nature of, of reality. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I love it. Um, so that was, that's, that's a key point. In other words, we can't just change things like that, generally speaking. Uh, as Marx says, men and women make their own history, but they do not do so under circumstances chosen by themselves. And I can't remember the rest of the quote, but it talks about the weight of the, uh, the history being like the weight of the Alps. On the, the weight of all the dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. Thank you so much. That's exactly it. How do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> because he's a closet Marxist like me. Invisible <laughs> <laughs> closet. <laughs> yeah, that's a closet. <laughs> and I also wanted. So thank you for for, for that. Well, you're all right, but none of you get any prizes. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I also wanted to make the point about what to a non-South African or non-African, Southern African uh, eye looks like a dance. Uh, the, the student talking to the students at the University of Cape Town was doing that, wasn't he? And he did a call and response with them. And then we go to 
the opposition to apartheid, uh, the NC movement and so on, and they also were doing that dance. Now I think that's a really good example. Oh. Yeah, good, of a social practice. Uh, it's called the Toy Toy, and those are some uh, things about it. It was used um, across southern Africa as a, as a weapon, as a power, as the use of power by people who are, you know, on the face of it, relatively uh, powerless. And we heard that Amandla, Aweto, um, in there. So the history is being used, the past is being used, uh, and a social practice, you know, a set of recurrent behaviours with uh, understandings and emotions, and emotions very powerful here, um, being deployed in a in a particular social context for uh, a particular end. So powerful that Robert Mugabe found it. Found it. So that's the definition, classic definition, not an altogether wonderful one, I think, uh, but it will do for now by records of a social practice. And you, if you apply that to the toy toy that we saw just then, it applies uh, very, uh, very nicely. <coughs> and that background knowledge and so on, all of this impinges on the nature of change, and it's not so simple as simply changing attitudes, behaviours and choices. And power is often forgotten uh, in this approach. Uh, so here is an example uh, from, this is a transcript of an interview I did in, in South Africa at a mer newly merged institution which consisted of four previously separate institutions, some of which were historically black and under-resourced. This was post-apartheid, but still under-resourced. And uh, one in particular was um, historically white and very well resourced. And what they had to do, having merged uh, by government edict, was to develop a common curriculum. Um, so you had three departments, previously separate departments in previously separate institutions, for example, of law, of sociology, of media studies, of English, and so on. Three, four, two, one, sometimes just. And they had to come together and determine a common uh, curriculum. What a wonderful moment in history, and I was invited in to uh, to uh, do some interviews. This is, so this is not the person I interviewed, this is an actor. Uh, some of you did do some of this acting for me, just in this one thing. Anne-Marie, thank you. So, <laughs> nice uh, so this is about power in the discussions in law in this new the On Campus Z had a very, really interest in trying to work out what would be the best for us in terms of location out of the three law teaching campuses. We were desperate not to be moved to Law in Campus X or Law in Campus Y and wanted to retain their location. We persuaded the university to let us stay with Campus X moving to us voluntarily. This was for a number of reasons. We argued strongly that we had branded our degree. We sold ourselves as the Campus Z School of Law. We love our historical buildings. Uh, before the merger was announced, we brought an architectural consultant so as not to deface the historical buildings and built in a new library. It, it's absolutely amazing. It's a lovely library. It's really lovely. So we were desperate to stay here. If we could swing it, we, we would try. I think we had an advantage in that Campus X had very few resources, very limited library facilities in particular, and we had all the access to databases and online stuff. Once the merger was formalised, we were keen to get together and renegotiate the curriculum. Again, we were keen to go ahead. We would push ahead and there was no going back. We had a joint intake of students, one year ahead of everyone else, to show the university that we were serious about staying on our campus. When I think back to how we came to persuade them, it, it was about people, persuasive personalities taking the initiative. In truth, we had sway of numbers. So when we said, look, we got a great course of first year level and we did our homework in advance, it was very hard for Campus X to argue against it. However, in discussing the curriculum in part two with the other campuses, it was tinkering because the Law Society largely determines the curriculum. But there were a number of strong personalities in our department who really pushed their particular teaching interest and research interest. To give an example, we have a person who's on the Human Rights Commission so in our degree, human rights is very strongly emphasised. It's weighted in favour of administrative law, constitutional law and human rights. 
So that our flagship, our distinctive feature, and before the meeting we said we are not giving up on that. That's what we're good at. That's what we made our name on. Uh, we also felt we had an image market-wise, reputation-wise. We definitely believed we had the better course and we had weight of numbers, so we went in in a strong position. You had your criminal lawyers, you had your family lawyers, you had your people who clearly saw it as their territory, trying to persuade everybody else. It was power plays, horse trading, we will give you this if you give us that. Usually, one dominant player took the lead. There are individual personalities, powerful personalities, strong players, who feel they own their specialisms and tend to dominate. They are going to sweet, squeeze out specialists who are less able to make their case. Coming from a position of authority, they came in and laid it down. We've always done it like this and intimidated people. Any thoughts on, on that? Don't have to be. I'll just give you the opportunity. Okay. Um, Don? It's a, it's a clear, clear statement of power, isn't it? Right, right the way through it. It's a, it's a continu There's a continuity of argument, which is, mm. which is based upon, upon a set of principles of power. Mm. Absolutely different forms of power too. Uh, Stephen Lukes has a very interesting book on, on power and he articulates basically we hear, we hear all of his forms of power there, including the whole resources and so on, right down to the Weberian, you know, making someone else some, do something they wouldn't otherwise do by intimidating people. Um, okay, so often forgotten in things like social practice theory, I would argue, uh, sorry, in, no, in terms of uh, communities of practice uh, theory, uh, and even thinking generally about this kind of area, uh, um, that whole issue of the application of different forms. So, theoretically, then, I think you can you can talk about, and I'm drawing here again from Chauvet out uh, this notion of entity and performance. The first one, templates of practice that we draw on. How do we do a lecture? What should we do? How should we behave in a lecture? How should students behave? How should we behave? What's beyond uh, the, the normal? Uh, what would become unusual and slightly disturbing? And so on. So templates and then actual performance. So that's, that's the language that Chauvet uh, talks about. Uh, practice as entity, practice as performance, the local instantiation of the template, which is a bit different from it. Reservoirs and repertoires comes from Bernstein, of course. Same kind of idea, reservoirs of ideas and practice and, and local instantiation of it. And of course, social practice theory says that contextual contingencies are all important. So the idea of transfer from one place to another, this theory of change stuff, and adoption of good practice is highly problematic. Context is everything, and ad adaptation uh, will always happen. Social ghosts, I've mentioned. Codes of signification, the, the kind of emotional responses and understandings of something like the toy toy or any other things that we have. It's unusual to us, but I'm using it as a non-normalized example. Um, recurrent practices, behavioral practices, discur discursive repertoires that we begin to take into account. I mean, the first couple of things in the first video, you know, we, we have words like Dean and Michaelmas and so on. All of that comes straight from, of course, the, the church, the ecclesiastical discourse. Nowadays, we've got fiscal discourse, you know, franchising, accreditation, and, and so on. Uh, they're shaping the way we think. Subjectivity is really important, power, and materiality, the actual physical stuff that we use, like PowerPoint shaping the way we sit, act, even think. Arguably, Adams, for example, thinks that PowerPoint makes us, begins to make us think in bullet points. I know I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I've talked about that in, in thinking about teaching and learning regimes, local cultures, if you like, uh, of sets of practices uh, that are particular. Shatsky, I've got, recently got into, you know, I don't know why, I can't get rid of that sound. It, <laughs> it always does that. Um, he talks about site ontologies, uh, local sets of realities that are created. Here, again, we're back to this reservoirs and repertoires, local repertoires or 
local uh, practices as performance. I was in uh, Oslo, uh, near Oslo last week, and I, I said, oh, we're really good at reading site ontologies. We're experts at it as humans. What do you think is going on here? Any questions about the, or, or comments rather, about the difference between these two pictures? I thought it was pretty obvious, but I got every answer you could possibly imagine. So, what, any, any thoughts on either of those two pictures or the comparison between them? Brett? What seems to involve most of the, the verbal being going in one direction from somebody to everybody else who's just sitting and listening. We assume they're listening dumbly, mm. though we ignore their thinking, mm. which is active. And the other one seems to involve multiple people all contributing in a much more ostensibly equal kind of relationship. Mm. Mm. We read that straight away, I mm. think. I do, anyway. I think it's also about... <laughs> I think it's also about power relations and positioning. So if there is a one central person who stands up, who's standing up yes. in one picture, and then um, the other picture seems to people are at the same kind of level. So it's it's about <coughs> different level of positioning that actually signals who's the most powerful one yes. in and, and the picture, and Thank then you. it's a structure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I thank you. I mean, that's. One of the main points I wanted to make, how the materiality of that room begins to structure what's going on. I mean, I read that as a lot of disgruntled people, you know, thinking, what the bloody hell? Mm -hmm. um, oh, you do too, good. But I got, oh, yeah, they're all listening carefully and taking notes and so on. <laughs> Are they? Um, well, my, my one was actually a serious question, because I've taken the, the light one and the bottom right to do the one. Gazing admirably at the guy with the shirt on. <laughs> and uh, he's kind of suddenly leading. Mm -hmm. Where the other one, uh, so you've got someone standing up and other people are sitting, but it looks to me to be more generally a part of the paper. Okay. Yeah. Who knows? Because they don't wear it. Yeah. I'm also sort of reading the style of the room. The first looks like to be quite austere, sort of church hall, maybe institutional sort of place, where the bottom one looks swanky business premises. And I don't know whether that has an impact on the sort of interactions that are going on. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of Brookfield's comment that there's more to making a democratic classroom than putting the chairs mm -hmm. in a circle. Exactly. You know, that we see still, oh, that's good, that's good, that's participatory, and even, mm -hmm. and actually, it mm -hmm. could just be masking a whole yeah. lot of power yeah. relations. Yeah, yeah that's, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. There's, a, there's a well known paper in the learning space <laughs> by Josh Moyes beyond the beanbags. <laughs> Love it. Let's read that. <laughs> Beyond the planet. Okay. Thanks. Um, right. And you might want to analyse our own situation here. But um, okay. If you, can you just click through? So I won't do it. I was I was going to uh, do a similar analysis of this. So if you just keep going. Um, but you can see, thanks, mm -hmm. different configurations, mm -hmm. different potential. Just hang on to that, that one a second. Thanks. Um, you mentioned the stuff about the stuff on the wall and so on. There were, you know, there's semiological reading we can be doing of, of the stuff uh, there and the power relations. Et Sorry, go on. Thanks. <laughs> We could have spent quite a long time. I won't, okay, thanks. Uh, so now you might disagree with me on this. I'm not. I'm not sure. I thought one way to talk about this would be to distinguish between habits and practices. I know Bourdieu talks about habitus, but he's not really talking about habits, not as we understand. Uh, not as we understand it. I'm not sure about this. Can they be changed by personal choice? But let's, for the moment, just leave that aside and suggest that they can. So. You know, individual things that we do, we develop recurrent practices um, that are personal habits, but I would say that pra social practices are in groove, there is a materiality about them, there are those of signification that come from the reservoirs, they're tough to change, uh, they tend to snap back um, to a very interesting article in one of the books I edited about trying to create online a space that was completely democratic between students and, 
and lecturers, you know, and this would be open for everybody and so on. But the, of course, it all snapped back to differences, hierarchical differences and so on. Um, and they, thanks. Uh, you're earning your prize. Here. <laughs> <laughs> and practices are enmeshed both horizontally and uh, hierarchically with each other. And again, that's one of the problems, I think, in the literature. They tend to think about particular practices, whether it be anything to do with education, higher education, uh, the focus is on the practice, not on how it relates to other other sets of practices. For example, how trying to enhance teaching and trying to enhance research, the REF and the TEF, you know, work together and the practices associated uh, with that. So this is a very rubbish um, diagram, which is very English focused in its examples of, of that. And they can be well meshed or they can be not joined up, operating in contradiction. There may be policy paradoxes and practice uh, paradoxes occurring between them. Thank you. Um, and again, you know, uh, Chauve, and I'm going to stop soon, very soon, uh, for discussion. Chauve et al. have again inspired certainly my thinking on this. We, in the report, we talk about, you know, changing things a bit, substituting or, or altering things and then having a whole, and we've got a, a whole sort of revolution in, in terms of what you do in teaching and learning. There's a little uh, spectrum in there. But I've changed my language a bit since reading stuff by Chauve et al. They talk about recrafting practices and substituting practices, including, of course, potentially practices of, uh, around learning and teaching. And they say, yes, of course, we can recraft practices. Uh, we can introduce online things. We can introduce new, new technologies. We can do things in, in more sort of student-centered ways and so on. We can substitute practices. We can simply change other, other ways of doing it. Um, but they say, you know, we actually really need to think about the way practices mesh together. If we want to have change, if we really want to change, then again, in a sense, we're, if we're talking about in, you know, individual practices and practice, practice bundles uh, on their own, we're, we're mi missing the bigger picture of the meshing of practices. Um, and so I began to think quite a bit about that. And this is where I'm getting really speculative now. Um, and started reading some of the stuff on health, and particularly AIDS, and how AIDS was attacked. And if you remember, if you're old enough and, and lived in the, uh, the UK at the time, remember those adverts on television with the big uh, iceberg and stuff? And it was basically saying to people, change your practices. And in fact, the, those same three letters, A, B, C, were used uh, in that advert. Um, and in the whole, everybody got a, a pamphlet through the door and so on. It must have cost, cost an absolute fortune. ABC, in this case, not attitudes, behaviors, and choices, but abstain, be faithful, condomize. <laughs> and there was a, a whole uh, list of other letters in the alphabet, in turn, were added to that by jokers or serious people. <laughs> the letters AIDS themselves, I won't even tell you what that, that was changed to, but the people who believed that it was an American conspiracy and so on changed AIDS into something, something etc. But they began to find that that really wasn't working and so began to adopt a holistic approach. And, and that, that this study by Avert, there's a reference list at the end, it's a very interesting uh, study which talks about the significance of context and the significance of bundles of practices and shaping the spread of AIDS and having to tackle how you need to tackle, understand first of all, and then tackle those particular meshed, enmeshed practices in a particular context. It's different from context to context. Very interesting study and made me think a lot about this question of raising all the ships, systemic, systemic change. And you could say the same thing, you know, you get a lot of self-help books, you know, the seven effective, the seven habits of effective leaders, <laughs> usually on airport shelves, or you know, lose two stone in three days by this diet and so on. Um, okay, but that's in, that's A B C, um, attitudes, behaviours, choices, and they tend not to work. But they work for a bit, and then people slip back. Why do they slip back? Because it's practices and not habits, and it's enmeshed in a whole bunch of other things. Get more exercise. Well, I can't. I have a, you know. Uh, 
I have to drive to work. There's no public transport. It's 20 miles away. How am I going to do that? And so on. So it's not just about individual choices. So instead of talking about lifestyle, some of this work begins to talk about collective lifestyles and trying to capture that, that social uh, side. There's only one more, uh, apart from the references. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, however, I mean, my argument is, and I'm coming to the close now, not to say that ABC isn't important, uh, but that we need to rebalance our thinking. And if we're thinking about systemic change and systemic enhancement, um, we just need to rebalance a bit our thinking uh, on these issues. Uh, but individual profitability, uh, profitability in a broad sense, in terms of save time or um, job satisfaction or whatever it is, is still important. The individual is still important. As I say, I'm just trying to rebalance it. The point of this picture is a story in The Guardian the other day journalist mother-in-law, totally uninterested uh, in um, information technology, didn't know one end of a computer from another, didn't know how to switch it on, wasn't, it, wasn't at all interested. She, she was, to quote the article, a technophobe from central casting, great phrase, until uh, he showed her eBay. And she wasn't interested in computers, but boy, was she interested in porcelain figurines <laughs> uh, and that was it Woof, she's off uh, so you know just to sort of say the other side uh, yes that can work too but will it change the system it might change an individual will it change the system uh, I don't think so um, and yes the sorry is one uh, so I think I said all of that and the final slide is the references if you're interested I'll stop thank you So we start often with um, with an unproblematized problem. Yes. Um, now, for example, in, in this particular case, you know, the thing that the thing that strikes me is that it was almost as though the the hefty concern was based upon the concept of no change with regard to things like student numbers. And yet, we know that over that period, there was a change in student number. Um, and I wonder whether, whether that whole area of, of change versus no change was something which you, you were picking up in some ways in, in what you were looking at. Was that something that was coming across? I, well, I think it was coming across in terms of policy contradictions. Um, you know, the desire to widen participation very same time as raising fees. Uh, so not really analyzing the whole 
situation or not thinking about the ref while trying to, and this is the very same body funding and organising both, um, but in separate in separate things. So not thinking holistically. But I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I think to understand change and to think about theories of change management, you really have to understand the status quo in in very in two in at least two different ways. One is kind of ontologically. How does it work socially, the status quo? And then in terms of the detail, the sorts of things you're talking about of um, a particular context and what, what's at the moment stable and what might change, perhaps as a consequence of the other changes, or maybe a, due to a separate set of vectors of, of, uh, of initiatives and so on. Um, somebody once wrote that uh, change in education is like people throwing pots from the top of a tall building. You know, from, from, the, from, the, from the policy makers' viewpoint, you know, here's a lovely pot. <laughs> it's yours. From the people down below who are doing three million different things, uh, what they get is a load of shards that they don't really understand uh, properly and don't really fit into anything else that they're doing. It's very pessimistic, but I think there's some truth in it. So I absolutely agree with you. Yeah, thinking about the status quo must precede any change initiative. Any other questions? Well, uh, codes of signification is one of the phrases I, uh, you know, I use, and there's a case study I've, I've used in um, Cultures and Change in Higher Education of an English department, uh, and the suggestion came from a central unit that there should be peer review of, uh, by students, student uh, peer review of, of each other's work, uh, peer assessment, and so on. And um, people laughed at that, staff laughed at the notion of, so is that a value? I would call it a code of signification. You know, that, that is not something that is appropriate. It's beyond the um, conventions of appropriateness, another uh, of, the, of the phrases of moments of teaching and learning regimes. So yeah, absolutely. There is, a t I think there's a word for it in psychology, and I've forgotten what it is, Colin might tell me, but a, a tendency of people to think, to believe that others think the way they do and have the same set of values that they do. Um, so they post something on Facebook and just assume that everybody will agree with it, not realizing that actually there's a whole range of values, codes of signification, or whatever, and that's so true. Excellence is a great word, uh, a great example of that. I hear excellence, and I hear reform, and I start running. Because I know that usually it's going to be used in detrimental ways. Brett? Um, I'm a sort of curious about the phrase that came up a number of times, methodological individualism. And I suppose really what, I mean, it's a, it is a, another pessimistic thought, but it's kind of like, I'm thinking, what is the work being done here by the word methodological? Because it's as though you're saying the problem is simply the, the programs are conceived to change things in an individual way, whereas in fact the whole, the whole edifice is individualistic from the beginning. So the value systems imposed by the incentive structures that are, you, you know, you said everything, uh, uh, you can't view a habit, you have to view a practice, it's a one more, uh, there's more and more context of it all the time. So the political context enforces a view that we're here to empower students individually, as it were. Yeah. No politician is going to say um, that they're not interested in individual student outcomes. Therefore, it seems perverse to expect that change initiatives or even the evaluation of those would, in some sense, avoid these wider incentive structures. So my, I suppose my pessimistic thought is that without challenging some of those external incentive structures, which seems to be something that universities don't have a lot of power to do, 
we're going to be forever saddled with some of this individualism, and it's more than just methodological individualism. It is. I'm hoping you'll cheer me up a bit. But that's no, I'm sorry. I was <laughs> except to say that, as I said, I was I was in Norway uh, with a load of uh, policy makers and quality agency and uh, institutional um, leaders and academics and so on last week. And they got talking about the law of Yante. I don't know whether I'm pronouncing that right. It's J-A-N-T-E. And apparently this is something that is very well known in Norway. It comes from a, a novel, actually. But basically it's a list of rules. And it kind of sums up a, a Norwegian way of thinking. And the discussion was, does it still apply? Do we Norwegians still think like that? And so on. Um, but I found it fascinating. And basically the, the law of Yante says... Don't put yourself above others. Don't think of yourself as special. Work for the community. You know, those, about 10 of those kind of statements. Um, and, you know, it, hey, it's a Scandinavian country. Tax is 50%. Everything works. It's brilliant. Uh, <laughs> better than Scotland. So, <laughs> no, surely not. So it, it doesn't have to be this way. The green paper doesn't have to be you know, in another context, we might see something different, and we do elsewhere. So, if any other questions or comments? Rachel, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And again, actually, the Swedish writer, um, Mats Alvesen, talks about these multiple cultural configurations and so on. So you, it's hard to, and you shouldn't, I suppose, generalize at a national level. It's far too gross. But uh, you know, I think you can see probably from the broad trends. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, another co interesting conversation I had was about student engagement and student, and, and not just me, but it was part of the discussion. Student participation in, um, you know, at what level student participation happened? Uh, was it just in committee meetings and so on? Were they properly briefed and ready? Could they fully participate? Um, and I was describing the situation here. And, and the story I got, and I don't know whether it's true, is, duh, students you know, are fully engaged in designing courses and so on. And that it, certainly individual conversation I'm thinking of. The person sort of looked at me as if to say, uh, obviously. So I don't know, that seemed to be I was quite struck by that. Okay, John. Oh, and unless there's an online one, I can wait. Um, I'm just sort of thinking this through in my mind, but it seems to me underlying some of these sort of policy initiatives is a very strange sense of the relationship between the teacher and the student. And, you know, so the idea is, you know, behind national, you know, teaching awards, well, a, a good teacher is one who's very student-centred and all of that. And yet, a lot of these sort of initiatives with this, you know, focus on... Um, student welfare and student engagement, 
they, they take quite a strange view of acad academics. And I mean, something like a lot of things like the kettles, there was a huge, a huge um, human cost to some of the academics involved with that. You know, I know people involved in these settles, and at first it was exciting, and, you know, will we have time to get all of our glossy brochures published? And then they were quickly, you know, under anxiety about achieving, and then before they knew it, they were being wound up and displaced and things like that. And there's no sense in these sorts of policy initiatives about, you know, in the name, I don't know of any students who in the name of bettering their experience would like to think of, you know, workers treated in the way that sometimes the academics are in this, you know, shiny initiative, and then the bauble falls off the tree and breaks. And it's, I suppose it's just an observation, but that, that relational aspect between student and teacher seems to be ignored. Yeah, I, was, I was thinking back to something that you put the pot early on, before, which was this um, um, political ideology. Um, and certainly across the period of, of, of the study that you were looking at, you, um, one could argue that there were shifts in terms of political ideology. Um, those shifts may have been uh, 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 gradual shifts in some respects. They might have been. <laughs> Yes. Quite dramatic in, in, in other respects, mm. but, but there were certain. Yeah, sure, things sure. There. I wonder whether, whether you. Uh, the, the other thing that I think maybe, maybe relates to that is this concept of um, pedagogical ideology. And whether you felt that in, from, from this study that, that there was anything coming out there about whether there was a shift in pedagogical ideology across this period, or whether in fact that itself hadn't shifted? It, w it was, I mean, it's a very interesting question, but it wasn't really something that we, we looked at. Um, so I really can't say anything about that. I mean, I, I would, in, in thinking about pedagogical ideology or educational ideology, I, I would distinguish between four strands, templates, reservoirs and so on. Progressivism, student-centeredness if you like. Traditionalism, discipline-centeredness. Uh, vocationalism, centeredness on UK PLC. And social reconstructionism, like we saw in the video uh, with the students. Um, was there a shift? I, I have no evidence, I have no evidence to, to say. In South Africa, uh, social reconstructionism big time, but it's shifting in its nature. Um, right from 1994, they've had this transformation agenda, which is addressing uh, apartheid, uh, the, the inequalities of apartheid. But now the students are, you know, we've got a student revolution on our hands there. It's interesting, including storming into the Senate the other day, throwing bottles and sandwiches and, uh, at the vice chancellor and uh, and so on, and huge concessions have been made suddenly that could, couldn't have been made before. And it's not just about roads must fall; it's about fees must fall, and they have. Uh, it's about attacking neo-colonialism. It's about uh, appointments. It's about uh, it's about outsourcing of staff. It's a big, huge, big agenda. So you can see these sudden shifts, but our study couldn't say anything about that. We've got a question from uh, Rob online, which unfortunately will have to be our last question. Uh, so Rob, if that's what's for the question. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just thinking that um, the review was obviously undertaken after a period where resources were probably higher than they'd ever been, maybe, or certainly higher than they're likely to be for a long while, and whether there was something that sort of inherently led to practices that weren't all that helpful like the large-scale shiny projects at the expense of more sort of grounded bottom-up developments and things and whether we might get almost a kind of benefit of pauperism of having to fo <laughs> focus on I know it's, uh, <laughs> but given that you know I guess as a question do you think we're ever likely to get those levels of um, funding allocations for development of teaching and uh -huh. um, and if not, you know, can that be maybe turned to an advantage? <laughs> Do more with less. Classic <laughs> Sorry, I know it sounds... Neoliberals. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I mean, there was a lot of money around, and that was one of our, that was one of the sort of pitfalls that we were trying to avoid, saying it was too much money, and it was, you know, we, what we don't want to say is there shouldn't be money for enhancing learning and teaching. But there is a question about value for money in all of that half a billion quid in the 74, 374 settles and 350 million quid. Um, so we definitely don't want to be saying, oh, what a, you know, what a waste of money, or you shouldn't put that much money into enhancing and teaching. What we're saying is, you should be a bit more thoughtful about it. Give time for planning. Be more systemic in your thinking, uh, etc. Uh, we knew, of course, that while we were doing the report, that the uh, review, the you know, the, the um, periodic review of uh, funding was just about to happen. Internal funding across the departments and so on, government departments. Uh, and we knew that there was going to be a huge cut of around 30%. So, you know, that's that's why the whole thing was framed in terms of, you know, what um, what is the role for Hefke in a resource depleted environment? Will it be that again? I doubt it. Um, can we can we do better with less? Well, yeah. I mean, what I've talked about is a lot of wasted opportunities, really. So probably couldn't do as well, but we could do better proportionally with fewer resources, I would say. So I just feel that maybe there was some kind of um, almost... Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Silver lining. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm thinking oh. more that, you know, I'm really focusing on the missed opportunities that, you know, people, people were almost encouraged to buy into that approach that effectively hoist them on their own petard in the end because, um, you know, it it provided, I think you've called it a valence between their own um, position and the offerings of, you know, being able to have a photo opportunity with a, a ribbon cutting outside a brand, brand new building and so on, that maybe the sector as a whole missed an opportunity to really focus that funding and really um, I, I just hope it's ready next time if that ever happens again. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Robert. There's a lot of squabbling, you know, CEDA and the HEA and, and before the formation of the LTA between the uh, ILTHE and the LTSN and, you know, real political power battles going on internally for people who are supposed to be talking about the same thing and aiming at the same thing. Thanks, Rob. Jan, you want you... Oh, I was just saying that, that it, it was strange. During that period of you know, incredibly high funding in England, <laughs> if you went to any HE or teaching and learning conference and people started talking about you know, the huge levels of funding, you would always find a troublesome person for up north going, not in Scotland. <laughs> you know, and there was sort of a, a pride, actually, in, on the one hand, complaining bitterly that we didn't have the same funding. I mean, we, I was in Scotland at the time. Um, and at the same time, a pride in actually being able to work in a system yeah. was doing it with less. Exactly. Your quality enhanced, or your Australian, I know <laughs> I'm just not Scottish, I think no, you're I'm, I'm just Scottish. <laughs> uh, the quality enhancement, enhancement, the E stands for enhancement, not excellence. The quality enhancement framework in Scotland, for, for my money, is a well integrated, well thought through, well planned example um, of how to do it. Okay, thanks for that, Paul. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Um, I like it. Um, Whiskey's good. I haven't yet. Uh, not enough time to actually go into why I like it, but um, it's a bit rare. I like it. Okay, thanks very much, Paul, for um, again a really interesting and quite recent, I think, in place presentation with lots of different things for us to look at and think about. And thanks everyone for your questions. Um, if you're interested in reviewing this, a copy of the PowerPoint and a video will be made available shortly on the Andreas website. Um, I'm not allowed to say that the room and video conference will be available because we're being evicted. Um, <laughs> but I am happy to say that the next seminar will take place in this room, B8 County County South, next Wednesday, the 18th of November, and it's Reg Sweetman, Sweetman sorry, who is from the Department of Education at the University of Oslo, whose title is Learning Outcomes in Universities, How Are They Interpreted and Practiced in Norway? So it's something to look forward to last week, but uh, next week, but just before we leave, can we just thank Paul again for... Thank you.